continuing our journey through Cain by Gene Toomer playlist down below for all videos from this. Today we're looking at the couplet Reapers and November Cotton Flower. Now, when I say couplet, if you look at the structure of this, at least for part one, you have kind of like a prose piece and then two quick poems. And a lot of times there's even like a call and response or a reaction to the prose pieces around it that the poems are responding to. It's part of why this is argued to be a short story cycle or a novel, because there is a design. There is interconnectiveness that we could potentially pull together on themes and what Gene Toomer may have been attempting to convey to us. We start with 10 poems in part one, go down to five in part two, and then there's no direct poems in the last part, because what's kind of happening is you start to see this narrative smashing together almost the identity of prose and poetry as you move into the second part, and then it just becomes this dialectal kind of uh, lyrical play. So in the same way that racial consciousness is explored through this novel and kind of even questioned a little bit with maybe him questioning his own identity, so too does the lyrical and writing style explore how it can move between this. It's a very brilliant modernist work. Which brings me to a line about the structure of these two poems, right? The best laid schemes of mice and men. An old Robert Burns poem to a mouse, where this farmer is plowing his land, and basically when he's plowing and ripping up the dirt, he destroys a mouse's home, right? And how does he react? Well, he chooses to show remorse, right? He feels bad for destroying this other mouse's livelihood. And it's this idea that the mouse can make the best plans possible in terms of the house, in terms of where he's going to live, in terms of the beautiful way he's going to design the tunnels underground, just to have it swept and destroyed away by a more powerful, maybe even describing as oppressing force, coming through and deciding they're going to farm. Farmer's not trying to be mean, he's not trying to be hurtful, but by sheer weight of the gravity of his decisions, his power in the structure here, he's able to just completely destroy the best laid plans of this mouse. And he chooses to show remorse about it in the Burns poem. So when we first turn to Reapers, Black reapers with the sound of steel on stones are sharpening scythes. I see them place the hones in their hip pocket as a thing that's done and start their silent swinging one by one. Black horses drive a mower through the weeds and there a field rat, startled, squealing bleeds, his belly close to the ground. I see the blade, blood-stained, continue cutting weeds and shade. So who is the narrator in this first piece? And even in the, the, when you look at the book across a whole, we have a first person narrator telling us the story and he's witnessing, like he sees these farmers doing this, right? And Black Reapers, okay, is that a representation of death, right? Like we had death in the opening poem with Carantha and we already see kind of how some of the themes are calling back and forth to each other, where in Carantha, you saw that we had the, the slave spirituals kind of injected into the middle of prose. Well, now we have these poems evoking some of the similar themes and such. You get to see some of the design of this masterpiece. So are the Black Reapers death? No, they're just farmers that are working the land, right? In terms of a scythe, you know, you have like the, the hip pocket um, whetstone typically that you'd pull out and you'd have to sharpen the scythe, clean it off, and then you keep working to clear the land away. The farmers are described as Black Reapers. What does Black mean in this context? Is it a description of their disposition, their view on life? Is it their circumstance? Is it the pigmentation of their skin? Are these African-American workers working in the field potentially? But regardless, in the second stanza, we see black horses, a second reference to black in terms of are the horses black? Are the horses representing death here? The difference is, is that they're pulling the plow in this situation. So it's kind of, um, in the Burns poem, you have a farmer who says he's directly responsible for destroying this mouse's home. Now in Reapers by Toomer, we have an instance where farmers are working and even the horse pulling the plow destroys the, the, the rat basically, right? It slices a rat in two as it dies and bleeds out on the field. When we look at it contextually, where is power in this story, right? Is it the workers that are plowing the land that are deciding to do this or are they just being hired to work it out? Like where is the oppressive force in this poem? When we look at the Burns poem, it was in the farmer choosing to plow his land. Well, we don't know who owns this land. Is it the Black Reaper farmers? Is it the people owning the Black horses pushing it? Possibly it's another force out there that owns the decision behind this. And are the middlemen, the Black Reapers, the farmers, are they being oppressed into working? And is that why, you know, there's no remorse shown potentially, right? They're not responsible for the decision here. It's just the action of plowing 
causes harm to others. So we come back to that central idea again. When is a stronger oppressive force needing to maybe show remorse, right? They're not meaning to destroy or harm the rats. They're doing what they were hired to do, and it causes harm in the rat's life. You know, it's kind of a broad statement, but I think that empathy and that ability to connect is kind of what defines our humanity. And at this point in time in America, you had a lot of white Americans, you know, in terms of this being a racial consciousness type of uh, exploration, that were owning the lands, that were driving a lot of the African Americans into the lower classes to work the lands. So where is their representation in perhaps the exploration of empathy? So back to the narrator in terms of the opening. The narrator's witnessing this. He sees the farmers working the land, and they're not demonstrating necessarily the reaction, right? Because they're not the ones that are perhaps really owning this decision, that are really owning the oppressive force. In the same way that we saw direct power in the Burns poem, here we see indirect power, where there's something that's pushing all of these farmers along fatalistically to the point where they're almost being robbed of their humanity is, is the way that I would interpret the story. If anyone's been to the Ford Theater out in Washington, D.C., you go through the Lincoln Museum. Again, the president that signed into law that all men are supposed to be created equal and abolished slavery, right? Well, he didn't sign that all men are created equal. He enacted that principle. And at the end of that tour, you come to this part where you see this book and you're asked to describe something you saw that was unfair, unjust, whether it be discriminatory or something that just wasn't appropriate. And you're asked to sign your name to say the next time you see something like that, that you'll stand up for what's right. You'll stand up for justice. And I can't help but wonder, what was this farmer thinking as he watches this, as he watches the, the, the rat be sliced, right? Where's the justice in the situation? Where's the empathy Where's the fact that a larger oppressive force has the right to destroy something within their power like that? And I think that comes back to that question in the Ford Theater of when you see something that's inappropriate, someone being abused or going through an oppressive situation like this, where is our responsibility in the humanitarian response of showing empathy and standing up for what's right? Now for November Cottonflower, it's a very quick sonnet, right? Bull weevil's coming and the winter's cold. Made cotton stalks look rusty seasons old and cotton, scarce as any southern snow, was vanishing. The branch, so pinched and slow, failed in its function as the autumn rake. Drought-fighting soil has caused the soil to take all water from the streams. Dead birds were found in wells a hundred feet below the ground. Such was the season when the flower bloomed. Old folks were startled, and it soon assumed significance. Superstition saw something in it had never seen before. Brown eyes that loved without a trace of fear. Beauty so sudden for that time of year. So opening bull weevils coming. I love this opening line because it's a interesting part of America's past, right? You know, if this was at least published 1923, this is kind of, um, well, the bull weevil's a bug, if you didn't know, that came along and destroys cotton crops, right? Like if you go to Mexican history, there's entire fields that were just left abandoned because the bull weevils just consumed it, destroying all property, destroying all gains that could have been coming out of that cotton. And it impacted America as it starts to migrate to America, right? And that's, you know, there's a lot of reasons for the Great Migration where, you know, I think some 6 million African Americans migrated from the South up North. A lot of reasons for it. But one of them, of course, is the cotton trade. King Cotton was challenged by this little bug that came along and consumed all of the uh, profits from it. Well, farmers basically being devastated by bull weevils destroying their crops. And then you also have the winter is coming, right, in terms of the end of the season, and it talks about droughts and birds dying in wells, and you don't know exactly which drought he's referring to, at least I don't, I'm not aware of which drought he's specifically referring to, because there's a couple around this time, right? At any point in time in America, there's, there's droughts impacting various farmers. But one of the things that is interesting is how the bird dies in the well, right? And birds are typically representative of flight of freedom, of escape. And in this time period, you have a lot of the great migration of African Americans traveling up north looking for better lives, looking for escape and freedom, perhaps from some of the uh, oppressive lifestyles that were put upon them in the South, in America at that time. And it's kind of depressing, right? We don't exactly have a glasses half full look at life with this poem, or even just the beginning stories, right? Death is something that pervades 
all of these initial stories. Uh, dusk is also a theme that one of the critics in the back of the Norton Critical Edition writes about. She talks about how dusk is this in between light and dark, right? Like we're not trying to define one thing or the other. So if we bring that into the discussion, you know, who was picking cotton in the 1920s, right? A big part of the institutionalized slavery was importing African Americans for that. And they were still heavily employed in the South for that purpose. It's not exactly a happy story, is it? And some were still looking for hope, right? And at the at the end, the turn of this poem, we have beauty appearing where you wouldn't expect it, right? Amongst this drought, amongst the snow, the end of the harvest, we have the beautiful cotton flower. And who's able to recognize that beauty? Who sees the beauty, right? It's the brown eyes, right? This is a story about an African-American in the South still seeing beauty where almost it seems hopeless. But it's also kind of the fusion, right, of definitions where, you know, you have the white and the darkness to, to some of the critics' points about dusk and blending, right? If we look at Toomer himself, he claims to have been seven ethnicities, right? So, so who am I and how am I going to define myself, right? You have a person who is being put through some harsh times, and a lot of people are choosing to go up north to change that, to say, what is my definition in life? I don't know. Maybe it's just a symbol of hope where it's dark. Maybe it's a symbol of turning the page for a better future in terms of the Great Migration and what could that represent for people defining themselves. Maybe it is that blurring of lines between lightness and dark and dusk like some of the critics have written about. When we see abuse, when we see something that is inappropriate, and our choice is how to react, whether we empathize with that person and want to improve America, improve other people around us lives, I think that's where the connection for this poetry and this book for it means something to me. It's not meant for me to represent other people's lives. It's meant for me to reflect on my own and how I choose to interact with others and reflect that. And I think these are, I think a lot of these stories, these poems, we see how in the beginning we're dealing with this divide of light and darkness. And we're going to move, like I said, through the rest of this book where you're going to start to see it blend further and question further what does identity mean, that these are important things to reflect upon as we start out this journey. So let's move on to our next story. Again, playlist to Gene Toomer, uh, Kane down below for to follow along with the journey. Hope to see you guys there. Una out.